progress is the nothing personal word of the day. Today is December 26, 2022. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. Hope everyone's feeling good. Last show of this form. We're going to do a show Friday, which is going to be sort of a year-end show, the 30th. But right now, the word of the day is progress. Because whoever said progress is a slow process wasn't talking about me because I'm a P-I-M-P. 50 Cent had it right. Not the first pitch. He didn't have that right. But I think 50 Cent knew what he was talking about when he was talking to Steve Cohn. Because this weekend, there was no progress in the Carlos Correa signing. We did two shows on it last week. One, he signs with the Mets. Two, owners going crazy. Commissioner's office going crazy. What's Steve Cohn doing? He went past the imaginary $300 million line. He's going to have a payroll and tax of over half a billion dollars. Uh-oh. His tax alone is greater than the payroll of 10 teams next year. Uh-oh. We told you on Friday's show, pre-holiday, this does not make the commissioner happy. None of it. A lot goes on behind the scenes. Phone calls are made. We talked about that. But then all of a sudden, the unexpected happened. Or was it? 469. All of a sudden, the unexpected happened. Except I wasn't surprised. Word came out this weekend while you were slain and eating and opening presents, if you're lucky enough to have presents, that the Mets gave Carlos Correa physical. Normal. It's what you do before you officially sign a free agent. As you remember, the Giants signed Carlos Correa 13 350, pending physical. Physical red flag. Boris said, I'm not renegotiating. Hey, Steve Cohn, do 12 for 315. We're going to forget that thing ever happened in Frisco. People in Frisco going crazy, canceling season tickets, hating on the owners. They stink. You suck. Nope. They're just smart. Me getting shade from Mets fans as I criticize the Correa signing. And then all of a sudden, there's a red flag with the physical again. Now, Scott Boris isn't leaking that out. Why would he want it to be known that there's a problem with his player? Nope. Steve Cohn's not leaking that out. Why would Steve Cohn leak it out? Steve Cohn doesn't need a physical. That's what makes me laugh about the physicals. His quotes from after the signing to the New York Post and other places. Maybe it's just the New York Post. This was the over-the-top move. We needed a bat. I had my eyes set on Carlos Correa. This is it. We saw our move and we made it. Steve Cohn of the half a billion dollars, you think he cares about a physical? To me, if I'm Steve Cohn, I call up my guys and say, we're signing Correa 12 3 15. If you're going to be a P-I-M-P, then it doesn't matter if there's an I-N-J-U-R-Y. W-H-Y, because if Correa is hurt, no problem. Sign the next guy, because there's always a next guy. So Steve Cohn's not leaking it unless he was lying. Wait, could he have been lying about wanting to do whatever was necessary to win a World Series in three to five years? Nope. Was he saying he doesn't want to lose money next year and Correa put him over the top? Nope. Was he saying he doesn't want to pay the tax, the Steve Cohn tax? Nope. He didn't say any of those things. We could have avoided the entire weekend festivities. I mean, not the Christmas and Hanukkah festivities, but the other festivities, as Steve Cohn had just said to his medical personnel, hey, don't, don't bother. Hold on. Wait, let me get a mirror. I have a mirror. Hold, honey, get me a mirror out of the lanai in Kauai. All right, just stick that in front of Correa's nose. Is it fogging? Hold on. Oh, my God. Yes, it is. Sign him up. Get that press conference ready. Get the backdrop. Don't worry about me, Billy. You take care of it. I don't want to be there. I'm not that kind of owner. <laughs> now, just, and, and plan it with Boris. Boris has to be there. Yes, he likes celebrating Christmas with his family. So bring him to New York. Jersey. Hat. It's going to be great. Cut to game 20 of the 2023 season. Down goes Correa, maybe. Did you know that he was injured? Don't know. Don't care. What are you going to do now? Well, we're going to trade the Phillies for Turner. Or there'll be another shortstop. Or they'll get another bat somewhere else. Doesn't much matter, right? 
Now, why would Major League Baseball not want Correa on the Mets? Hmm. Do you think that's possible? Do you think the Major League Baseball may have gotten involved in the Correa deal and in the guarantee language? I'll answer that question for you. You're goddamn right I did. I said it. It is not beyond the pale because I've seen it before. You think Major League Baseball, specifically Commissioner Rob Manford, do you think he's happy with what Steve Cohn's doing? The reason why he's not happy, no matter what he says publicly, no matter what he says to his lieutenants, deep in the bowels of his brilliant mind, the ninth commissioner is saying to himself, I don't want any problems with any of my renewals, meaning his own contract. I don't want any collective bargaining problems. I don't want owners conspiring against each other, with each other. Because remember the math. If there are eight owners who want Steve Cohn to suffer, eight owners can make Steve Cohn suffer. That's all it takes. Eight owners. Do you think what Steve Cohn is doing is upsetting eight owners? How do you think John Middleton feels in Philadelphia? Someone go interview John Middleton. He of the I'll spend stupid money. He of the I'm all in with the Philadelphia Phillies. We won the pennant and we added Turner. We're going higher, higher, higher. Jackie Wilson style. Tell me, think he's unhappy? Can you imagine that John Middleton and Stu Sturmberg are on the same side of an issue? Stu Sturmberg being the owner of the Tampa Bay Rays. They're not on the same side of any issue. Hey, the sky's blue. Horse hockey. The sky's green. No matter what, they're on opposite sides of every issue. By definition. Low payroll, high payroll. Guess what? Different division, different league, doesn't matter. Think Stu Sternberg is happy with what Steve Cohn's doing? Nope. So you think MLB may have said to Steve, listen, let me tell you what's gonna happen here. First, you're not signing him to 12 3 Second, once the contract gets adjusted for years and money, then we are gonna have guaranteed language that is going to be tripped if there's any reoccurrence of this injury because we are not making Charles Johnson, I may have called him Robert Johnson, by the way, it's Charles Johnson, the owner of the San Francisco Giants. Thank you for that correction. But I came up with that correction, not you. Maybe one of you did, I may not have seen it. We are not hanging Charles Johnson, no matter his political views which are shared by many of the owners, by the way. But no matter that, we are not going to let the Giants be known as the team that let Correa get away and then get absolutely made fun of. If you're going to make fun of the Giants, make fun of Conforto for two years at $36 million. God bless Scott Boris. Tip your hat. Never say anything like it. If you're going to make fun of the Giants, that's fine. Three years for Taylor and Trevor Rogers. Fine. But don't let any teams believe that they can't get out of contracts before they're finished because of a physical. That is critical to leverage that teams use. Critical. It's part of collective bargaining. It's part of the way we negotiate with agents. It's the way we punish injured players because we don't want them to continue their escalating salaries when they're not performing because the overarching issue in baseball, the number one, is not competitive imbalance. It's not the fact that the bases aren't long enough or that there's no no pitch clock. The number one problem in baseball is the amount of money paid to players not to play, both because they stink and because they're injured. And the fact that contracts are guaranteed and it doesn't matter if you stink or you're injured, you still get paid. That is the issue that baseball has been trying to solve for. So this is a great opportunity for them to start moving the ball a little bit toward the other goal line, just a tiny bit. And the way you do it is a quick phone call to a six hour time zone earlier than New York. That's where, what Hawaii is, six hours. Hey, Steve, nope, NGTH baby not going to happen. Now, Scott Boris is at the Christmas table carving the ham with a gold plated carving knife. He's got two phones on the table, an earpiece in, a loving family surrounding him because he's a could be a father and grandfather, whatever he is, no idea. But everyone's got a family and everyone's loving and what they do off the court does not have any indication to what they are on the court. So I'm not talking about his Christmas dinner, whether he served latkes or not. What I am saying is that during Christmas, Boris works. 
I worked every Christmas, not because I'm Jewish, because the owner, not because he's Jewish, would call even the non-Jewish people with the organization, say, hey, what do we got today? But Jeffrey, it's Christmas. Who cares? Let's work. Why has there been no update on Korea? What is Steve Cohen trying to accomplish? They're renegotiating the guarantee language. The guarantee language is going to have something in it that says if Carlos Correa has a lower left leg injury that is as a result of the injury he suffered earlier in his career and misses a certain amount of time, the following three things will happen. The 12 year deal will become nine years. The 315 will become 250. And by the way, we have the right to opt out of the remaining contract if he misses more than a year. There's all sorts of things being negotiated and the union and Boris are saying, no way, Jose, absolutely no way. I could do it like Hank Azaria. No way, Jose, from Along Came Polly. What the union and Scott Boris are making sure is that the guarantee language is absolutely firm because A, they want the 13, 315, uh, the 12, 315 on the books. B, they do not want to set the precedent that there is any possibility of changing guarantee language because of a pre-existing injury that has not impacted the health of the player. Correa played 138 games, 150 games. He has not gone on the injured list because of this leg injury since the leg injury. And the union says to the league, and because the league has to approve guarantee language, don't forget that, the Mets cannot sign Correa without league approval. Are we clear on that fact? Rob Manford can control whether Correa is signed by the Mets. All right, you know that. The union also approves guarantee language of its players because they are protecting the rights of the players within their union. So what happens if he goes on the IL? You think Carlos Correa just says, hey, that's not my lower left leg. The Mets say, hey, you're hitting 220. You have no power. We're losing. Yes, it was your lower leg. Hey, my lower leg's fine. Let's get a doctor. Mets team doctor says lower leg's hurt. That's why you're not playing. The union gets a doctor. All in the guarantee language that's being negotiated right now over Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. Possibly yodel, yodel, yodel. For me, it's hostess cupcake, cupcake, cupcake. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to give a doctor. Hey, the union doctor says it has nothing to do with his left leg. It's his right patella with a little bit of his under sphincter. That's the issue. No, nope, Mets disagree. What do you do in that case? You put in the contract, we're gonna get a third doctor. The team and the player has to agree on the name of the third doctor. It will come from a list of second opinion doctors that there is a list agreed to between when there's any dispute, there's a second opinion doctor the players get to go to, not affiliated with the team. There's a previously accepted list of second opinion doctors. Choose from someone on that list, period. You don't like it, you get like in a jury. No, not that doctor. Then the player can say, no, not that doctor. Eventually, you're gonna find a third doctor. The third doctor is the tiebreaker. He examines Correa, looks at the MRIs, looks at the scans and says, you were right. It's his gluteus maximus pituitary gland. Okay, then nothing gets tripped. Or the third doctor says, hey, that's because the vibration from the numbness from the plate that was put in, that came out this weekend. That's why he's hurt, all right? Then that trips the provision. You think all that can get happen, can happen between the kugel and the ham? Of course not. It's gonna take some time and they got time. Who doesn't have time? Everybody because it doesn't matter with Boris now. With the Giants, he didn't have time. Remember what he said? Buy San Francisco, hey Steve, sign him. There was that little blurb that Minnesota made their same offer again. I don't buy that at all. Minnesota cannot afford to sign a player like Correa to that type of deal, even when they've lived with him for a year, when there is even the possibility that he's going to not make it, even though he's only 28. You just don't go nine, 10 years if you're the Twins or about 15 other teams. But now that he's been burned in San Francisco, potentially burned in New York, you think right now that Boris didn't call Minnesota already and say, hey, will you go 12, 3, 15? And they said, get out of here. I'm celebrating. I'm lighting the chimney. It's the eighth night. Maybe that happened. You think he called the other 27 teams? Hey, I got Correa here. Anyone looking at a pillow deal? Uh-oh, Boris isn't gonna want another pillow deal for Correa the three year up 
$2 million deal. Was it the same as Bauer? That sounds like the Bauer deal. The three-year something deal with Minnesota with the opt-out after one year. Boris doesn't want to do that. Keep doing that for Correa. This is a tainted player now. How easy is it for teams to taint? The taint is always the easy part. It's making sure that all the owners follow the taint and don't sign the guy to a decade long contract. Progress, word leaked out. The Mets and Correa and Boris are making progress. They're working through the guarantee language. This is gonna be an interesting story to watch. Just follow me on Twitter, at David P. Sampson. I'll post some videos no matter where I am or what I'm doing. Once this Correa thing, once there's news, because there will be news, Daniel Day-Lewis. There will be news. There's also going to be news for sure in Denver. I'm sitting around. It's cool, right? When Hanukkah and Christmas are together. So much sports. Adam Silver and Roger Goodell are each watching. There's 20, there's five NBA games from noon until one in the morning there's three nfl games on it's just fantastic right everyone is feeling sloth like you're feeling like santa you look down you can barely see your you know what because your stomach is protruding because you couldn't resist the appetizers you couldn't resist having the carved prime rib whatever it is you ate you do one chip isn't that funny how it works am i the only one because i do have some sort of body dysmorphia i agree with you and i don't take that that's not a joke it's quite serious work on that but i always do the following and i don't know if anyone else is with me mentally maybe my brain just works this way but when i'm at a party and and we hosted 32 people yesterday but when i'm doing something i either decide i'm not going to eat cuz i'm feeling a little big but i can't stop once i start so if i say to myself no appies I'm just gonna save it for the meal and then I'm gonna take mostly salad. Once I break the dam, it's like, uh, what's the thing when you're holding in your pee and you finally go and then you have to go every 10 minutes but you didn't go for the first three hours of a night out? Breaking the seal. Thank you, Coca. I, that wasn't Coke, he doesn't wanna get credit for that. I just pretend that it was Coke, I just thought of it. Sometimes I like giving Coca credit. So I broke the seal when you're at a party and you have the first chip with salsa, the first chip with spinach dip, the first cucumber, the first taco dip, whatever it is, is the appy. The minute you break the seal for me, I'm all in. Like, all right, that's it. I had half a cookie. I'm going to finish the rest of the cookie. I'm not doing dessert today. All right, let me just have a little bit of the black and white cookie. Incidentally, some people eat the black side first. Some people eat the white side first. I actually go middle. It's like With Oreos, what do you do? I'm a splitter. I split the Oreo and I eat the non-stuffing side first and then I split a second Oreo and I make myself a double stuff, which is always better because the stuff inside an Oreo, when it's single, is always better tasting for me. Unfortunately, I can't taste it, so I don't need Oreos anymore. I did cut Oreos out because love the fluff of the double stuff. So once you start, you don't stop. I have no idea where we were. Why was I even talking about that? That was a weird aside. We were transitioning so well from Korea to the, oh, because of all the sports I was watching. Hell yeah, I'm back, baby. So I'm sitting there watching and I know I've got a pick of the day pending and it's the end of the year and I'm gonna have to give my stats and tell you how I did. And there it is, I'm watching the Broncos. And I said to myself at 17, nothing, what the hell's going on here? How can they be so bad? And then I remembered the other segments I've done that Russell Wilson is so overpaid and he's so cocky thinking, oh yeah, I just gotta be better. That's what players do when they have a bad game, right? Hey, I just gotta be better. Coaches say it's on me. They all say the same thing. It's page one of the coach's playbook after a loss. After a win, you credit the coaching staff and you credit the players. After a loss, hey, we gotta play better, but it starts with me. I always like that when coaches say that. It starts with me. I gotta call timeouts better, better clock management. I gotta figure out which plays to call in what order, even though we script the beginning plays of a football game, but I gotta be better, I gotta be better. I like when coaches do that. Accountability. The Denver Broncos are an absolute disaster. They are stuck with Russell Wilson in a way that he's not even stuck with Sierra. 
What are they going to do? Trade them? Release them? Take on the dead money? Forget it. Now, they're owned by a billionaire. He may be richer than Steve Cohn. Paid $4.65 billion for the Broncos. You think that Rob Walton could care less that there's money owed to Russell Wilson? Or that there's dead cap money? Yes. Why rich owners in football cannot be as successful and separate themselves as much as rich owners in baseball? Huh. I got two letters for you. SC. Salary cap. Can't do anything about it. You can't write it away. So what are you going to do if you're the Broncos and you get humiliated by the Rams? Game, set, match. That is it for Nathaniel Hackett. He's done. They're stuck. Coca did the analysis because in his spare time, he's also a salary cap guru. Rob Walton's been told by his people that you're stuck with Wilson until after 2025. That's two more seasons, 23 and 24. And even then, their dead cap hit in 26. It's three more seasons, three, four, and five. They're stuck with him for three more seasons, Coca. Did I say two? I meant three. Their dead cap in 26 would be $31 million for the contract they signed. With a cap hit of 58, my God, they're so screwed. Russell Wilson's their quarterback. Now, they could play Tom Dick or Harry, Larry Moe or Curly. You know, give, give, give them a clipboard. Clipboard? That's not what it's called. I don't know what it's called. What's the thing called on the side? Um, clipboard. Thank you. God. Is today Monday? Sometimes my Monday shows are low energy, but not today because it's the last show of the week. Although we're going to have a show Friday, but it's a year-end show. Clipboard. Maybe Russell Wilson will take that. After that game, Nathaniel Hackett. Man, oh man, I think they're upset for all the losing. We all are. Every one of us. That's unacceptable. That's not what we're about. That was what the PR people told the players and the coach to say because all the players were saying the same thing. Russell Wilson, all of them. This is not who we are. Yeah, it is. You stink. We went in with the mindset we were going to win this game. <laughs> We never let our manager say that. Don't ever say after you lose, hey, we had the mindset we were gonna win. Really? NSS, baby. No blank, Sherlock. Wanna keep it clean, not explicit. We went into the game with the mindset we were gonna win. I think that the guy from the, um, oh, come on, Coca. Uh, Xavier McDaniel, is he the coach of the, uh, it's not Xavier. The, the guy from San Francisco coaches the Dolphins whatever his first name is. It's Mike. Is it Mike? Somebody McDaniel. Yes, Mike. Mike. No, said Daniel. McDaniel. Got it. He, after the, after the Dolphins lost to the Packers yesterday, he had a very similar type quote. Hey, at halftime, we, were, we thought we were good. We were going to win this game. <laughs> These guys are unreal. They all are. They really are. Here's the final wait to see of the year. Sorry, Nathaniel Hackett. You're getting fired. There's really no question about it. You can't watch that game yesterday. Do you think Roger Goodell was annoyed as he was watching that game and then watching the Buccaneers against the Cardinals? Nope, he wasn't. Because you were all watching too. You can all complain, oh, it was crap, blowouts, no one cares. Yet everybody's watching it. I was with someone yesterday and there was a, uh, a game going on between the Dolphins and the Packers. This is something that Roger Goodell just has to deal with because it's the reality. And uh, watching, and he was watching with a great deal of interest. Hey, who, who you from Wisconsin? You like Green Bay or Miami? Well, what's your story? Nope, I'm in the semifinals. It's all about Tyreek Hill. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm in the semifinals of my fantasy football league and I need Tyreek Hill to do well. And by the way, I could have played Tua, but I didn't. Thank God. It's just strange. People are watching, they're gambling, they're doing fantasy. They're not rooting for a team, they don't care. All right, yesterday Glass Onion came out. We're gonna take a break when we come back. It's the Knives Out mystery, it's Knives Out part two. We're gonna review it. And then we're gonna get to something that happened in the movie world that is absolutely staggering. We're all gonna learn something together. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. 
It's David Sampson. Thank you for rating, reviewing, subscribing. It has been one hell of a year. H-E double hockey sticks U-V-A. Thank you. Just keep doing what you're doing. Get on the YouTube page, Nothing Personal with David Sampson. We're going to go live starting Wednesday, January 4th, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, starting Wednesday the 4th. Just keep telling your friends and subscribe on YouTube. Thank you. Watched a lot of content. I was looking at my phone, Coca, where I keep track of all of the movies because every movie I see, I keep track of. And it's requiring, I'm showing you on Nothing Personal with YouTube channel right now. Look at the um, toggling it's requiring to get to the bottom. Look at that, all that toggle. Oi, it's a lot of toggle. Glass Onion came out on Netflix on the 23rd. Billboards all over Times Square. They're really pumping it up. Ed Norton, one of my favorite actors, you don't get to see him much, stars in it. Daniel Craig reprises his role as the detective trying to figure out the mystery. You remember the original Knives Out, which by the way, yesterday, while being totally social, not, I watched Glass Onion and after Glass Onion, I wanted to reintroduce myself to the original Knives Out with Daniel Craig and Chris Evans, etc., and Anna de Armas. Pin that name for a minute, not up, just pin it. We're gonna talk about her again shortly. Don't worry, Coco, we're gonna get to it. I promise. So I watched the original Knives Out after Glass Onion, but I wanna review Glass Onion. You got Daniel Craig, you got Ed Norton, you got Madeline Klein, you got Katherine Hahn, you got Kate Hudson. Um, what's the guy from Guardians of Galaxy, that huge guy with the tattoos? Is it Dave Botta? I didn't write it down, Coco, you'll have it. Dave Bautista, he's in the movie as well. All these guys go to Janelle Monet is a critical part of the of this movie. They go to a Greece island, a Greek island owned by Edward Norton, a private island. In the beginning, you see this scientist played by Leslie Odom in a role that I'd like to understand. I know why he took it, it's good work and he got paid a lot, but they certainly did not use his talents at all. So a box gets sent to him, it gets sent to Katherine Hahn, also didn't use her talents, she's so phenomenal. Gets sent to Kate Hudson who played an over the top diva in this movie. They all have to open the box and figure out a puzzle and they end up on a private island where Ed Norton plays this character like Dr. It reminded me of Dr. Evil. And you don't really know whether he's evil but you assume he's evil because he sort of looks evil. And I'm sort of sad looking at Edward Norton only because to me, he's, you know, American history X. He's, he's keeping the faith. He's primal fear. He's older, but he looks good. So you're watching the movie and you're thinking, I'm not even interested in the mystery. I don't even care. I have no attachment to any of these characters. And when you are looking at Janelle Monet, or you're looking at the, the, the Kate Hudson from Almost Famous, who have had to lose a guy in 10 days, just so amazing, daughter of, uh, of Goldie Hawn, you're saying to yourself, I wanna care. Who did it and why? Nope. And then I watched Knives Out again, and I realized I didn't care about that one either. That's a major problem. Now. It's entertaining. Running time's a little long, about 140 minutes, two hours, 20 minutes for Glass Onion. Too much, not enough excitement. I don't watch trailers. By the way, sorry, before I get to this, that I don't watch trailers, please keep sending me uh, content to watch. I, I can't get to all of it, but I do keep another list on my phone of content that you all tell me to watch. So thank you. Some of you come up with picks that I never would have gotten, never would have even heard of without you, and it turns out to be just incredible. My MVP for the year, by the way, believe it or not, is Coco, which is funny because we do not have similar tastes at all, but there's one thing about he just knows my taste. So he will, he wants me to watch good stuff. So when he tells me to watch something, almost always I pay attention. So trailers are things I don't watch because I used to, before nothing personal, I would watch trailers all the time, but I don't watch them anymore because I want to go into a movie and I want to be neutral. 
I want to have no sort of idea what I'm seeing, but it came at a suggestion either of the algorithms or of a listener or it's nominated for an Oscar. Either way, I'm going to watch it and I'm going to get through it. In the last couple of days, a U.S. District Court made a ruling on a lawsuit that I had not heard of, had not come across my desk or my phone is the more accurate answer. And I just found out about it and I want to talk about it for a few minutes with you. There was a movie a couple of years ago in 2019 that I reviewed on Nothing Personal. I believe, Coco, we reviewed yesterday, which is a movie with uh, Lily James and Hamish Patel, who gets into a bike accident and the whole world sort of changes and the Beatles stop being the Beatles. But he knew the Beatles and knew all their songs and he was a failed songwriter and he was a failed guitarist. And all of a sudden, he starts singing, Yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. And people are like, my God, that's a great song. And he said, yeah, that's the Beatles. And they said, who? And then he builds a career by simply releasing all the Beatles songs. So all of a sudden, there are two people, two people who say, hey, I spent $3.99 on Amazon to buy yesterday or to rent yesterday. And the reason I did it is that I watched the trailer and I relied on the trailer to rent the movie. In the trailer, callback was Anna de Armas. She didn't talk in the trailer, but she was clearly in a scene in the trailer. I rent the movie, I watched the movie. Oh my God, there's no Anna de Armas. I am gonna sue the studio Universal because they falsely got me to spend $3.99 because I thought I was getting ADA, and in fact, I only got LJ. It's absurd. Absolutely, patently absurd. How many times do you watch a trailer and you say, my God, that was the whole movie. That was a fun trailer, the movie sucked. I'm gonna sue the studio because I thought I was gonna laugh, I didn't laugh. All the jokes were in the trailer. Trailers are made to get you to watch the movie. They're there to entertain you, to give you an idea what the movie's about. How many times have you watched a trailer where a scene in the trailer is not in the final cut? It happens all the time because trailers are released and made and cut from dailies before the final edit's done. Certain things don't make the movie. That's how it goes. To me, this was an absolute loser, this case. And the decision came down on the side of the consumer. The studio argued it was free speech. I can put whatever I want in the trailer. I can put ants crawling through eyes and then have it be a romantic comedy. That's my business. What the judge said in the district court is nope. This is not protected as free speech. This is commercial speech, which means truth in advertising. You are only doing a trailer for the purpose of getting people to spend money on Amazon or buy a ticket to go to the theater. You have got to be honest in your trailer. I can't even believe what this means. The slippery slope that we are on, you better put some serious spikes on because you're sliding down the hill all the way. I'm going to need something in a trailer that says, wow, this trailer's fun, but the movie stinks. I'm going to need something in the trailer that says, if you're laughing at the trailer, don't get excited. The rest of the movie, not funny. I'm going to need the trailer to say, hey, this person's in it. Beware, she's naked. Now the theaters will say and the studios will say, well, wait a minute, we have ratings for that. Nudity, strong sexual situations. Violence. In the trailer, I didn't see anyone shooting a gun. And then I watched the movie and all of a sudden people are dying. They're shooting guns. If you're Universal Studios and you just lost this case, which they're gonna appeal, mark my words, this is going to the Supreme Court, this case. Because this changes everything. If it is ruled that a studio cannot put anything in a trailer that is not in the final product of the movie, your trailers are going to suffer for those of you who love trailers. The reason the studios can't let this go is the slippery slope that I just described. You cannot make it part of the rules that someone has to 
use the trailer as the basis for their ticket buy decision. Does that mean that a review, hey, I, I read this review, the review said the movie was great. The movie was terrible. I'm suing the New York Times for having that review in it. Of course not, it's absurd. Except for the fact that people use reviews all the time to decide whether or not to buy a movie. How about Rotten Tomatoes? Get ready, audience score, get ready. If people don't agree with your audience score, guess what they're gonna do? They're gonna sue you. It's an unbelievable case. We will keep you up to date because there will be more. Okay, nothing personal pick of the day. We're done, just so you know. We went two and uh, we went one and two this weekend. Let me review. Final score of 2022. 153, 126, and two. We had the Knicks five and a half over the Bulls. They lost on a great, great, like the 10-3 by one of their players. Sunday, we had the Broncos. I'm embarrassed by that pick. I'm sorry we lost it. Saturday, we had the Niners giving a touchdown to the Commanders. Jimmy G played great. Ha, ha, ha. It was purdy. I told you it was going to happen. So one and two, 153 and 126, and let me give you the numbers. If you took $100 and bet $100 on every one of my picks in 2022, you now have $445.50. That means if a team is three to one, we bet $100 and we win, we get $30. If we lose, we lose 100. If it's minus 110, we lose 110, uh, we lose 91, whatever the math is. Coca did the math, it's $100 bets every time. We turned $100 into $445.50, we finished, not that it matters, but it, I still like it, 153 and 126, that is 27 games over 500, we had two pushes. When we come back in January, we will continue with picks of the day, and the record will be swept clean and we will start at zero and zero thanks for being with me i know some of you have been betting every one of the picks of the day well that's what you did with your money if you were consistent don't chase amy don't do more than the picks if you just did the picks immediately when you heard the show at the exact lines that we gave you that's what happened so all of you doing the gambling out there and there's a lot of you you see all the leagues have now embraced sports books. That's how it is. There's no more going to the parking lot of Publix, right, to give money to your bookie. There's no more FedExing. There's no more wiring money offshore on an app. Everyone's betting legally now. It'll be in all 50 states soon. All the leagues have decided they're all in, but they're also trying to be very careful. We've had a theme throughout the year on integrity, I don't mean my personal integrity. I'm talking more specifically about the integrity of the on-field product. You can't believe that any players are gambling on their team or against their team. You can't believe that anybody's not being forthcoming about injuries or who's gonna start a game in Major League Baseball because people are making money decisions based on the information they're given that they expect to be right. And then they're betting. There are very, very strict rules. Do not bet on baseball when you're in baseball. Do not bet on sports when you're in baseball. The same rules are there for football. The same rules are there for coaching and coaches. Remember Miles Austin? Miles Austin was the wide receivers coach for the Jets. Jets are having a tough run right now, aren't they? My God. Miles Austin was suspended one year for gambling. It just happened a few days ago. He's claiming, I never bet on football, and I always bet legally over my personal device, like a phone, meaning he's got FanDuel or DraftKings. Not DraftKings, FanDuel or BetMGM or whatever they have. DraftKings. Maybe he has DraftKings. He should have DraftKings. It's the best one. That sounded too self-serving. No, it didn't. 
NFL has a problem because if they start investigating, they're going to find that Miles Austin is not the only coach who's using, who's gambling on games. Now, he didn't gamble on his own team or against his own team. But with the proliferation of gambling, are you really going to get rid of coaches who are doing online betting? You better have a long list ready. I don't mean the diversity list for the Rooney rule. I mean a long list of anybody. You better have a lot of Jeff Saturdays ready to roll. Just don't quite get that. Players have been suspended. The former Falcons, the uh, Jaguars wide receiver. Remember the guy, uh, Calvin Ridley? Suspended for a year, betting. You think this is it? No other players? There's an entire department that these leagues have. Entire departments that are dedicated to finding out who's gambling, if they're gambling, protecting integrity. They have no other choice. I don't think it made the... Jets any worse or better by having Miles Austin suspended. I just think it's a far bigger issue that if the NFL doesn't get a hold of or embrace, maybe the rules change and say, listen, don't you bet on football. That's the line. It's not like they drew a hard line in concrete all the sports leagues. They did. So they thought, hey, we're not associating with gambling. All of a sudden the line frays a little bit like the dotted lines on a highway that needs repaving from time to time, like the blurred line of morality that continues to move when you're making decisions that have results that you don't like, so you change your decision-making process. The lines of gambling are gonna keep moving in professional sports, and before you know it, coaches, players, they're all gonna be allowed to do online sports betting, just not on their sport. That's probably where it ends up. Can't keep suspending people like this. Who's gonna be left? Jets need a quarterback, not because he was suspended. Mike White, university school alum, hell yeah. Mike White didn't play because he is hurt. Zach Wilson, who did not exactly get a ring endorsement from the coach of the Jets. After the game this weekend, when the Jets lost to the Jaguars on Thursday, and we picked the Jaguars, that was a win. What came out this weekend was awesome. What came out was that the Jets are moving on from Zach Wilson. Wow. That's pretty major. And the reason it's major is that when you draft a rookie court, a quarterback, they're all rookies when you draft him in theory, and he's a top five pick, what did he go, Coca two? Was he that high up? Either the second quarterback taken or the second pick in the draft, whichever he was. And you get him a four-year deal. You can actually add a fifth year if you want extend it by a year. You can then tag the quarterback twice. So in theory, you can have a quarterback for seven years. When you're a team like the Jets, you can't keep getting the quarterbacks wrong. They're just going to let Zach Wilson go. They're going to pay him his money, take the dead cap. It's not a huge amount of money, but just let him go. And what are you going to trade for another one? Like we talked about, you to sign another one, going to draft another one. You're going to start the whole process over again. Why would the Jets want it out there that they're going to move on from Zach Wilson? Because the ideal thing would to be to find a trade partner. But the problem with getting that word out is I would rather release Zach Wilson quietly with no one knowing after I've worked out a trade for another quarterback. Because when teams know that you have a need that's called snipers, like when you have an injury, there's 10 teams who call you, hey, your third baseman just broke his hammock bone. We've got a third baseman for you. Hey, your pitcher just got Tommy John. Hey, we've got someone putting right in rotation. We'll take your best prospects. You think that any quarterbacks who are in the trade market, you think those teams all of a sudden, the ask went up? What about free agents? You think Baker Mayfield's just gonna go to New York for nothing? You want it out there the opposite. You want it out there that, hey, we believe in Zach Wilson. There is no way we're moving him. He is coming into next season as our quarterback. It doesn't matter if it's not true. That's something you have to realize when you are a team and you are putting stuff out there. It's not like Anna de Armas in a trailer. You do not have to be honest. Now, funny, we totally forgot about that with the Anna de Armas story. 
if we do a team calendar that has Giancarlo Stanton on it and then we trade him before the month of the calendar, did you buy that calendar, even though it's a freebie, did you buy a ticket to get that giveaway because you assumed that that player would be on it? Or is it your working assumption that, hey, it's the Marlins, anyone can go at any time? Same with the trailers. Don't you just know it? Jets moving on from Zach Wilson. Oi. All right. That's it. This was our last show of the year like this. We're going to release one more on December 30th for this Friday. That show is going to be sort of a recap. Give you my top movies, top shows. Catch up on some wait to sees. Enjoy Friday's show. Have a safe week between Christmas and New Year's. Have a very happy New Year also. We'll be back with the word of the day, 8 o'clock Wednesday morning, January 4th. Believe me, there'll be a lot to catch up on. Live, 8 a.m. on the Nothing Personal with David Sampson YouTube channel. Go to it and subscribe. Go to it and you'll see us live. You'll see how we do it live. It may look a lot like this or it may not. That could be a way to see. Remember, it's just business. Thank you, everyone. This is nothing personal. Thank you.